right, so we're going to be using numbers. No big surprise there. Let's start by talking about what kinds of numbers there are and um, getting a feel for them. So we've got numbers. There's all sorts of different kinds of numbers. You've got the real numbers, which we're going to be working with. And then there's the imaginary numbers, which we won't be working with yet. OK. So now real numbers, you've seen them all your life. That's the numbers you've been working with. And we're just going to make sure that we see the different categories that they fit in. And we'll start with the, the natural numbers of the whole numbers. Okay, the book calls it the whole numbers. Um, and they're just what they sound like. They're entire numbers. They're not parts of numbers. They're whole numbers. Okay? They're also either zero or positive numbers and not parts of numbers. Okay, so no negative numbers here in the whole numbers. All right. So that's this little box here. Now integers, these are also integers. That's why they're in the yellow integer box. Uh, but there's some integers that aren't whole numbers. OK, does that make sense? We've got uh, these whole numbers are completely contained by integers. So all whole numbers are integers. Uh, but some integers, uh, like negative 4, let's see. Let's So not only 0, 1, 2, 3, and all these positive numbers, but also going in the negative direction, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. But still, not parts of numbers, not decimals, not fractions, uh, just uh, entire numbers, that including the negatives. OK? So the whole numbers and the integers, all those are also rational numbers. But there's some rational numbers that aren't integers that aren't whole numbers. Um, rational numbers. We can conclude from the word ratio that's in there um, that these are ratios. Okay? They're ratios of one integer divided by another integer. Okay. So like 3 fourths. There's the integer 3 over the integer 4. So that's a rational number. We can have negative 2 over 3. So we have the integer negative 2 over the integer 3. Okay. Um, and anything that you can write that way uh, is a rational number. Okay. One half is another example. Um, one half you can write as 0.5. Okay, so that is a, a rational number as well, just represented as a decimal. Uh, we can do the same thing here. This would be negative 0.6 repeating. When you put a line over a number, it just means that goes and repeats over and over for infinity. Any number, any decimal that you see, if it stops, if it stops at some point, like 0.1235697, and it stops, that can be written as a rational number. Right? Because as you remember from place value, you just count out to the, that's maybe the 100,000th place. You just put that over 100,000, and there's a rational number. Also, if a decimal goes on forever and ever and ever, but there's a repeating pattern, then that could also be written as a rational number. So if we had 0 0.197, 197, and then what that 197 repeats forever and ever and ever, uh, that could all, you could also find a way to write that as one integer divided by another integer. Okay. So these are the ones we're going to be using today uh, and for quite a while after today. And then there's another set of numbers called the irrational numbers. And there's at least one that you're, I think, familiar with. Now. Does anybody know uh, the name of an uh, irrational number? It's pretty popular. You guys know this number? Have you seen that? Yeah, some yes, some no. OK, it's called what? What's it called? Pi. Pi? It's called pi. P-I. OK? And that's just uh, a letter that represents a number. It's 3.14159. It just keeps on going, and it doesn't repeat. There's no perceivable pattern. So it's not a rational number. Uh, there's other numbers like E. That's uh, approximately 2.718. And it just goes on and on and on. 
there's other numbers like phi, and there's all these numbers that have certain properties about them, they have, they have names, and they just can't be written as an integer divided by another integer, so they're called irrational numbers. Okay. Like I said, these are the guys that we're gonna be working with. Okay. So when I say integer, I want you to be able to recall what that means. So if I, if I say integer, I want you to recall that mean. Um, and likewise for rational whole numbers. So before I move on to the next thing, are there any questions about any of that? Um, so the first thing that I saw that uh, we could use some help on uh, is just putting, putting numbers on a number line. All right. So an important thing about a number line is that you indicate some kind of scale some kind of notion as to where you are. So a lot of people, when I ask you to graph, especially a couple of numbers on the on the number line, I would just, you know, I, I gave you these marks here, and I would just see something like a dot there and a dot over here. Okay. So what's the problem with that? Back here, yeah. You don't know what numbers they are. Yeah, what are they? Even though I tell you what numbers are supposed to be, I don't know that you fully understand it if you do that because are they far enough away? Is your scale, you know, the scale could be anything. This could be from here to here is one or from here to here is 100. Now you gotta kind of give me some kind of an indication as to what the scale is. Um, and I'm just trying to learn these names. That was Cameron. I don't know what those numbers are. Um, now even if you label them as, say, negative 1.5, and negative 3.5. I can see that the scale makes sense, so I can assume that each of those marks is one, right? But what, what's still a problem with this? This is just like one more thing that we need to be sure that we indicate. Yeah? Yeah, there's gotta be some kind of a, a clue as to uh, do we really understand where these numbers belong uh, in relation to other numbers? So we need a zero. Zero, and then it would be nice to have one, two, three, and so on. But if you have that, if you just had zero and negative 1.5 and negative 3.5, you're like, yeah, that works, because if I assume that scale is one, that is where they would go, okay? Um, also, on a number line, if you have zero, uh, to the left, what kind of numbers do we have to the left? We have negative numbers, yeah? Negative. And over here, of course, we have positive numbers. Right. So on a number line, that's how it works. So just be careful and uh, be sure to label your negative numbers over there, positive numbers over here. Okay. Um, which of these numbers is the bigger number, the greater number? Nathan, is it Nathan? Yeah. Okay, Nathan. 1.5. One one point, which one? Negative 1.5. Negative 1.5, why? Because it's closer to zero. That, I mean, yes, it is closer to zero. Like, if you want to tell me which one is bigger, one's closer to zero. But what if I label uh, this one and this two? One's closer to zero, is it greater? No. no. So it doesn't quite work all the time. So what, like, what rule would always work? If it's the closest to a whole number? Um, well, closest to a whole number. Um, and I could put seven eighths, and I could put 1.5. This was closer to one, which is the whole number, which is further away from any whole numbers. You see what I'm saying? Um, not too complicated. 
if I want to know which, if I'm comparing two numbers and I want to know which one is the greater number, and I'm looking on the number scale, where are the greater numbers located? Data? On the right, yeah. So the number's on the right on the number scale. It's the larger number is the greater number. Okay? Um, because, obviously, the, the number, we know greater numbers over here, positives. 100 is bigger, greater than 2. We, we know that. Um, in negative numbers, you can think of those as like a debt. If I owe you $2 uh, and someone owes you $1, the person who owes you one dollar like has more money, right? They're indebted to you less, so they're closer to having an actual positive amount of money. Okay, so from least to greatest, it always goes from least to greatest. Okay. Um, all right. So maybe maybe a fourth of you understood this this next idea. So we're going to spend some time on that. Um, if I put a number in here, like two, what do these vertical bars mean? Yeah. Absolute value. Yes, Caleb, absolute value. Caleb, can you tell me what absolute value means in your own words? Okay, so uh, for one, absolute value is always positive. So that's what. Caleb says uh, it's always positive. Is that a fair summarization of what you said? Okay. So if you if if you have these absolute value symbols and uh, there's a negative in there, well that's going to be two. The absolute value of positive two is also two. The absolute value of negative seven is seven. The absolute value of negative x is x. The absolute value of, of whatever the number is, it's just like the positive version of that. Okay. Is there another way we could describe it? Rather than just telling me how to find the absolute value, is there a definition for absolute value? I saw it on a few of the tests. Um, the most value a number can have, right? The most value a number can have? What do you mean by that? Like the highest it can go, like if it's negative, yeah, I think I see what you're saying. Uh, like how far you have to go to get to that number? Yeah. From where? From the negative. Where you would like, like if I say how far do I have to go to get to that number? Where do I start to then get to whatever number we're talking about? The negative. You start at the negative. Just anywhere in the negative, and like if if I want to know, uh, let's say this is negative five. And I want to know what the absolute value of negative 5 is. What is the absolute value of negative 5? 5. 5. So when we say how far we have to get, go to get to negative 5, how far we have to walk, where do we start walking towards negative 5? Negative 5. You start, and then where do you go then? To 5. Well, if you start from negative 5 and you go to 5, I, I think I might be confusing you. From negative 5 to 5, that's 10. Zero. Okay, so to zero. So if you go from negative five to zero, you've gone five. Right? So the technical definition, I guess, which is it's kind of not very technical, but the distance uh, from zero, right? Just how far away is it from zero? Absolute value, and those those vertical lines just means how far away from zero is this number? Well, this is five away. We always just say in a positive way, five. It's five away, it's 10 away, it's the square root of three away from zero. Okay. So something like negative seven, what's, what is the value of this? It's seven, how far away is negative from seven from zero? It's seven away, so the absolute value is seven. Then, so the value of this is seven, so if we put a negative there, now what is this expression worth? Maybe we're just all thinking it. Negative seven? 
Because this part is worth what? And then this makes it negative, so it's negative 7. Okay. Um, that there is worth negative 7, the absolute value of a positive. Same as the absolute value of a negative, it's still 7. This still makes it negative, negative 7. So absolute value, it's always positive. It's just the measure of the distance from 0 to that number. Um, so this has, I don't know, it's not a specific lesson from the book or something, but I was noticing on your test when you when you have a question that's asked with fractions, there's fractions in the question, um, and especially if it's something like put these in order from least to greatest. If the question's in fractions, the answer should be in fractions. You should leave your answer in fractions. If it starts out as a fraction, leave it as a fraction, especially uh, if you're going to use it to calculate something. Okay, so just almost a, <coughs> a side note. Um, I mean, if you technically are, are reading the, the, the problem, it, it never says to write it as decimal, so you should just assume you don't change things around like that. Right? So, um, especially with something like one, <coughs> one sixth, okay? That is approximately point, uh, let's see, one, six, 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 six. You can just write six is forever and never be done, right? Um, so if you just take one sixth and you change it to point one six seven, then you got a problem. Uh, it's not point one six seven, and if you use this and add it to something or multiply it by something, you're not multiplied by one sixth anymore, which is what you were given. You're multiplying it by something that's kind of close to 1 6, and your answer is going to be not quite right. Um, and a lot of you, when I asked you to put some numbers in order from least to greatest, were putting decimals. Just leave them as fractions. If I give you a fraction, leave it as a fraction. Um, so let's look at a problem where we're going to order things from least to greatest. So we'll just take an example from the book here. This is 2.1 in the homework, um, let's see, 17. So you give me negative 2 thirds, uh, negative 0.6, negative 1, 1 third. If we want to put these in order from least to greatest, how are we going to do that? We know which numbers are bigger than other numbers? Any ideas? <coughs> yes, I'm just pointing at people. Alex. Into a fraction and a whole number? Or a whole number. A fraction or a whole number? Okay. Uh, so you're saying turn this into a whole number? Or just all the numbers would be either a fraction or a whole number. Okay. Okay, so this is a fraction, this fraction is a whole number, but this is a decimal, so we need to turn it into what? A whole number. Or a fraction. A fraction? Okay. Well, what fraction would that be? Well, look at point 0.6. Uh, what place value is that? The tenth. The tenths. Right? So anything you have here that's just that many over 10, right? And what's this position? Yeah? The, the hundredths place? Okay, hundredths. So anything there would be over 100, or if we had 0.65, say, um, then that would be 65 hundredths. Okay. And what's the next position? Thousands. Okay. 
So likewise, if we had something there, it'd be 653 over 1,000. That's how many thousands there are. Okay. What's the next position? What's that? 100 thousands? 10 thousands. 100 thousands. What is it? After 100 thousands? 10 thousands, 100 thousands, millions, etc. millions. Uh, we went a thousand, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions, billions. ten millions. <laughs> After ten millions? Hundred millions? After hundred millions? So, hundred millions, billions, after billions, ten billions, hundred billions, trillions, ten trillions, hundred trillions, quadrillions, uh, ten quadrillions, hundred quadrillions. This is goes like that, right? Um, so, if we were to come back to this question. How could we write this as a fraction, if that's how we choose to go? What is that? Three fifths. Well, it could start out as six tenths, and then they both have a two in common, and so it's now three fifths, so negative three fifths. Negative two thirds, negative three fifths, negative one, one third. Okay. Well, in this list, it's pretty clear that one third is the greatest number because it's the only positive number there is. Right? So that could go way out here. But you know what? As we move this direction, what's closer to one third? Is it negative one or negative three fifths or negative two thirds? Which is more negative? Which should go all the way over here? Which is bigger? Right? How do we compare them? And I'm asking you. Out there, the pool of your brain knowledge is, is this answer. Caleb? Three fifths of the last one? Like furthest to the left? So it's the smallest number? Okay. And how do you get there? Negative one's the smallest number. So, like, we could say it like this the absolute value of one. Which is positive. Right? Is it bigger than the absolute value of three fifths? The absolute value. What is the absolute value of one? And what's the absolute value of three fifths? Okay. So between one and three fifths, which is bigger? How do we know? That three fifths is a piece of one, right? When the when the the numerator is smaller than the denominator, we know. We just have just a part of the whole. Well, okay, so one has a larger absolute value. It means it's further from zero. Right? It's further from zero. Is negative one further from zero than negative two thirds? Yes, because if we look at one and two thirds, two thirds is, when I say this, I mean positive two thirds. Positive one is bigger than positive two thirds. So, okay, negative one is way out here. It must be the least. How about between two thirds and three fifths? Negative two thirds and negative three fifths. Which should come next? Three fifths. How can we be sure? Negative two thirds. Two thirds. How can we be sure? Two fifths. Because <coughs> How do you know? Negative three fifths is less than two thirds. Okay. Now this is circular. Uh, how do we know for sure which is larger? and we look at three-fifths, which is larger? Two and three, and how can we tell? Two-thirds. How can we tell? 
How, how did you make that decision that two thirds is larger? Because three is bigger than two, or because there's more pieces left? Yeah. Okay. So because there's more pieces left, it's smaller. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Then let's say we compare two thirds. Okay. How many pieces left? I'm not saying that you're wrong when two-thirds is bigger. Uh, what I'm saying is the reasoning, what we want to have is reasoning that's, that's solid every time. So two-thirds and um, uh, 91 hundredths. Okay, how many pieces left to get to the whole here? Nine, that's a lot more pieces. Which is bigger, two-thirds or 91 hundredths? Ninety-one one hundredths, yeah, it's way, well, it's much closer to the whole than two-thirds is, right? So you see what I'm saying? The number of pieces left, that's not an indication of which is bigger. Yeah. Okay, so now we, what we need to do is compare apples to apples. Right? If I ask you what's farther, um, 27,000 feet or uh, four and a half miles, can you tell me right off the top of your head, 27,000 feet and four and a half miles? If you don't know, what do you need to do? Change your boat to feet or change your boat to miles. You have to compare miles to miles or feet to feet. And when we're talking about thirds and fifths, you can't compare thirds to fifths. You also can't add thirds to fifths. You gotta make them the same thing, okay? And when we add fractions together in just a, a few minutes, I'm going to talk about that more in depth, but let's just deal with, um, if you remember how to find common denominator, we'll just we'll go with that for now. How do we find a common denominator? Or what's going to be the common denominator? Let's start there. 15, okay, because you can multiply 3 by 5 to get 15, and 5 by 3 to get 15, and that's the same thing. So we know that we multiply, that's how we get the common denominator. We multiply the denominators, each of them, to get the new denominator. So. We'll multiply this by 5, right? Is that it? Just multiply the denominator by 5 and you get the common denominator and you'll have 2 fifteenths. You've got to do top. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. You have to multiply the numerator by 5 as well as the denominator because, well, what's 5 divided by 5? It's what? 5 divided by 5 is 1. 5 divided by 5 is 1. And so really what we're doing is multiplying a number, two thirds, and multiplying by one. What happens when you multiply a number by one? Data? It stays the same, nothing happens. And so two thirds stays two thirds, really. It doesn't change when you multiply by one. If you multiply two thirds by one, it's still two thirds. If we multiply it by a different looking one, it's still one. So it doesn't change what it's worth, it just change how it looks. So we get 10 15 And what are we going to multiply 5 by? 3. 3. So we get 9 fifteenths. All right. We've got 10 fifteenths and 9 fifteenths. That is, that is actually quite close. Right? They are very, very close to each other. All right? Um, so yeah, you've got to get a common denominator. You've got to get a way to compare like things. If they're not the same kind of thing, you cannot compare them. So. If two thirds is, is, is the same as 10 fifteenths, then the negative two thirds, negative 10 fifteenths, negative three fifths is negative nine fifteenths. Okay, so what comes next? After negative one, negative two thirds, because that's negative 10 fifteenths, and that is further from zero. Okay, and next would be, well, you only have one thing left negative three-fifths. Okay? That's good. That's, that's the way we, we 
should do it. You should do it that way. You should turn decimals into fractions and then decide about the fraction um, with common denominators between fractions, which is, uh, I wrote a negative 10 15th. Um, decide which is further from zero. It should be negative 2 15th. Okay. And then uh, 1 third is the largest, way out here on the positive. Well, I have to get out a piece of paper. Uh, no. Desks. No. And very similar to number 17. And you do number 20. Rational numbers include the fractions like we're used to looking at fractions. But it turns out integers, whole numbers, they actually are fractions as well. How could I write 2 as a fraction? Data? 2 over 1. Now it's a fraction. You're dividing 2 by 1. It's still 2. So we, we just write it as 2. But we can write it as a fraction. So we're going to turn everything into fractions or rational numbers. Into a rational number. And find common denominators. That'll do it. All right, so I'm just going to have you do this on your own. I'll come around, and if you have questions, I'll answer those questions. Uh, and I'll see how it's going. Okay. Individual effort. Uh, it's in 2.2, number 20. That is page... Okay, let me write this up here. Then I'll be back to the back of the room. <coughs> Negative 2.7, 1 half, 0. 0.3, 0. 3, and negative 7.
Well, let's just look at it. There's a 2.7 million, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Would the instruction look different? challenge here, so we'll just go over it together. Uh, starting with 2.7. If we're going to use the idea that we'll turn everything into fractions, get common denominators so that we can compare everything, we'll start with 2.7, making it a fraction. Okay. Uh, well, let's look at, at, at 2.7, or, or negative 2.7. So here's, say, 0, there's 1, there's 2, there's 3. So negative 2.7 would be somewhere right there, so a little bit past 2.5. So it's two and some more, right? Two and a little bit more. Um, two and, and how much more? What's that? Seven tenths, okay? Two and seven tenths. Well, you know the fraction already. You just said it, right? Seven tenths. Um, so we have now negative two and seven tenths. Um, I was I was in a college class once, and, and um, there was a kind of like a letter to the editor or something like that. Somebody saying we should abolish uh, fractions from curriculum altogether, and he said, you know, it's so simple. We, we only use decimals, and he gave the example of I was like, say that's two seventy, like it was dollars. You see 2.70, you know it's 2 and 7 tenths of a dollar. And in, in his argument against fractions, he used fractions to say how simple decimals are, 7 tenths or, or you know, 70 hundredths of a dollar. I thought that was kind of funny. Anyway, we're going to keep going with this now. We have 2 and 7 tenths, all right. Um, well, this is really, let, let's just look at, at 2 and 7 tenths, the number 2 and 7 tenths, like the absolute value of that. Um, it's 2 and seven tenths more. Well, if I'm gonna compare that to say a half, it's, it's kind of obvious, but maybe um, if I was gonna compare it to um, 30 thirteenths, right? Can you tell me which is larger right now off the top of your head, two and seven tenths and 30 and 30 thirteenths? No, what's the problem? Why can't I compare them? Same kind of fraction? OK, so we need mixed numbers. Which is a mixed number, this or that? This one. And what's this called? Improper fraction. I hate that word, because if you're going to add fractions, you're going to add fractions that look like this, one integer over another integer. If you're going to multiply fractions, you're going to multiply one integer over another by one integer over another integer. You never interact to mixed numbers. That doesn't happen. The only time we have mixed numbers is when we get done and we want to get a scope of how big this thing is. Two and seven tenths. Oh, I can, I can imagine how big that is. I can conceptualize that. Um, so, but if you want to use it and you want to multiply it by another number or you want to add it to another number or something like that, you always make it improper, which I think is, is funny because the only time you use them is in this form. So I wouldn't choose improper as the term, but we're going to turn, we could turn this into um, a mixed number or we could turn this into an improper fraction, which is what we'll do, we'll turn this into an improper fraction, okay? Uh, there is a shortcut that somebody, did, uh, Michelle, no, Natalia, okay, uh, Natalia, uh, she remembered the shortcut. I'm gonna we'll look at the shortcut in just a second, okay. Um, it comes from this. Uh, we have seven tenths and we have two. What we want is how many tenths it is. This can be written as a, as a mixed number. Right now it's written as 30 thirteenths. That's how many thirteenths make up that number. We want to figure out how many tenths make up this number. Okay. Well, 
Like I said, this is 2 plus 7 tenths, so we can just add these two things together if only this had the same what? How do we add fractions together? What do we need to add fractions together? Common denominator. What's the denominator of this 2? Right now. 1. What? 2 over 1. Okay, write that again. 2 over 1, we're really adding 7 tenths to it. 2 and 7 tenths is really just 2 over 1 plus 7 over 10. What do we need to, again, what do we need to add these fractions together? Common denominator. What's the denominator going to be? 10. How do we get that common denominator for 2 over 1? Huh? Times 10. Times 10 here, times 10 here. Yeah. And what do we get? 20 tenths. Okay. Did, did we need all that work to figure out that was 20 tenths? Maybe not. If you think about two things, like kind of the 10 pieces, how many pieces do you have? Yeah. 20 of those things. 20 of those tens. If you had two things and one, two, and you cut each of them into 10 pieces, okay, that's a bunch of tens. How many tens would that be? Well, this is 10 and this is 10, so that's all together 20 tens. And if I divide 20 by 10, I get 2. Okay, so we get 20 tens plus 7 tens. How many tens do we have now? 27 tenths. All right? Now, to the shortcut. Shortcut. If we want to write this as an improper fraction, Natalia, what do we do? You take the denominator yep. and then times it by the whole, whole number, and then you add the 7. Right. Okay. Now that we see what's really going on, that makes sense. Because we'll always want to have this number have the same denominator as this number. And since the denominator of a whole number is always 1, we'll always just multiply it by whatever, whatever the denominator is. So this will always come out to be this times that. And then we're adding it, right? We find out that this is 20 tenths, and we just add it to the 7 tenths we already had. So we add it to the 7 here. And when you multiply by 2 and add the 7, you get 27 tenths. All right? So now negative 2.7 becomes negative 27 tenths. We got one half. Now what's this as a fraction? Three tenths. And this is negative seven. Okay. Now we can kind of use the, the knowledge that we already have. We know that this is negative 2.7. It started out that way. So as we try to choose our least number, the number that is the smallest, well, it's going to be between the negative numbers, negative 2.7 and negative 7. These are positive, so they're definitely going to come a little later. Well, between negative 2.7 and negative 7, which is the smallest? Negative 7. And when we say smallest, we mean furthest to the left. Furthest to the left would be negative 7. Okay. Next. Now we can leave it the way that it started. We need it to be a fraction, though, to compare it to other numbers. Negative 2.7. Um, what would come next? One half or three tenths? Three tenths. How do we know that? Because point three is the, one half is the same as point five, and point five is bigger than point three. OK, you could change one half into a decimal as well, rather than taking. Um, so this is 0.3, this is 0.5, so 0.3 would come first, and 1 half would come next. Yeah. Now, we turn numbers into fractions because someone suggested that we do that, and it's a, a good way, a foolproof way, we'll always be able to compare numbers. Um, we could also um, look at the, we could look at the fractions and say, uh, well, one half would be five tenths. That's a pretty easy thing to determine. Out of ten, uh, ten, five would be half. Five tenths would be half. So five tenths is bigger also than three tenths. Or we can turn it into decimals. Um, so it's it's up to you. What I want in the end is for you to write it in the way that it started, not change decimals or fractions to decimals or vice versa. Um, and however you choose to compare the numbers, if it works, you can do that. Um, if you want to just change this to 0.5, uh, that works. If in the previous 
problem here. If we want to just say, let's look at, let's take negative two thirds, let's just pull our calculator out. Okay. And let's get this out. We got two thirds is 0.66666. And this seven is just because the next number is a six, and the calculator rounds this up to a seven. So it's just 0.6 forever. So negative 0.6 forever, or negative 0.6 which is further to the left? Negative 0.6 forever, right? And then negative 0.6 is smaller than that. So you know, 0.6 is, as you put more digits here, uh, the greater the, the absolute value of that number. So you can do it that way if you want. Okay. Just be sure that when you get done, you write it the way that it started, as a fraction or as a decimal, however it started. Um, okay, so that was just that was two point one. Now two point two, we're going to be adding real numbers. All right. Um, I. Just from looking at your tests, I can see that if I give you two integers, whether they be positive or negative, uh, majority of us are, are fine with that. Okay? One thing to look out for, though, um, let's say 2 minus 10, or negative 10 plus 2. What's the difference between these? You change. Um, well, this, the first sign is a negative, but also the first number is 10, right? So the sign of 10 stayed with 10. The sign of 2 stayed with 2. Um, let's do it this way. What, what number should I get when I do 2 minus 10? Negative 8. Negative 8. And what should I get when I do negative, two plus, negative 10 plus 2? Negative 8. Either way, this is. Remember what property did you? No, I didn't talk to you about this property yet. Yeah. Uh, we'll learn about these properties in just a second. If I switch the order of them, it shouldn't change anything. I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. 3 plus 5, 5 plus 3, they're both 8. 2 minus 10, or negative, two plus, negative 10 plus 2, also negative 8. Um, I just saw things like uh, 8, positive 8. Saw things like uh, negative 12. Got some negative 12s there. And I think that's just a matter of you know this. You know what a negative number is. You know that if on a number line you start at negative 10 and then you were to add 2, that means you move to the right 2. And that would put us at negative and negative. So that was just for, for simple addition of positive and negative numbers. That was just one of the small things that I saw on a, on a few tests. Um, this property right here, as well, take the opportunity to talk about it now, is called commutativity. We would say that addition is commutative. Commutative property. So, can somebody sum up what the commutative property says? That's a, an example of the commutative property. What does the commutative property say? Yep. Right. Doesn't matter when you when you're adding numbers, okay. And we understand that when we're subtracting ten, what we're adding, and what add, what number are we adding to two? Negative ten. Two plus negative ten. Okay. So there's that understanding. I'm adding negative ten 
So if I view it all as addition, addition of positive and negative numbers, if I switch the order of them, it doesn't matter which order they're in, it's all the same. There's a question like that on a test about, um, I think it was a Maria, she was adding up her profits from some June, July, and August from the summer. She added them up this way, her partner added them up the, some other way, we think it's the same thing. Yeah, it doesn't matter how you add up these numbers, which order you add them up, uh, because addition is commutative, okay? Um, if we were to add two uh, and negative 17 and five, how would you add these up? And keep in mind, you can only add two numbers. You can't add three numbers. Does that make sense? What do I mean by that? Of course I can find the sum with these three numbers up here. But what do I mean by you don't add three numbers, you add two numbers? You only add two numbers at a time, then you add the third number. Right. You find the result of two numbers, and now you have a new number, and then you add the other number, and then you add another number, you would add it to the result of that, and it would go on for however long it needs to be. So which two numbers do we add first? Like well, let's say we don't reorder, we don't use a commutative property here. Which would you add first? Um, go left to right. You would go left to right, you start here, go there, get the result, get there. Right? Could I add these two first and then that one later? I could. I could add these two first and add that one later. Okay? Whether I do these first and then add that one, or I add these two first and then that one afterwards, it doesn't matter. <coughs> and actually when, when in that, that word problem I was talking about, it, it's actually the associative property, it's, it's saying. This is associativity addition is associative. So it doesn't matter, when I, when I just group the numbers together, it doesn't matter if I group the first two together and do those first, or the second two together and do those first, and, and do this next. It doesn't matter. Now, if I were to ask you to remember these, um, which I will expect you to, when I say multiplication is commutative or addition is commutative and I'm referring to that property, I want that to bring to mind what that means but I'm not gonna drill you with memorization and, and test you and mark you down because you don't answer it right on a test, but it is going to be useful. I want you to understand what these are. So there's two of them, there's, there's two properties, really. Commutativity and associativity, right? Um, and these are the two main ones that I wanna be able to reference and not have too much confusion. Um, so their differences, are they clear? Is the difference between these pretty clear? Could someone express a, a main difference between these two? How does it, how in your mind do you separate the two? How does how do you make this one this one different from this one? You see that they're different, right? How are they different? How in your mind do you delineate between? There's three here, there's two here. Um, is that what makes the properties different? Not, not exactly. Nathan? The first one, there's the bumps with the opposite, and the second one, the breadth and the width. Okay, so here, the numbers themselves move, and here, just like your attention moves, right? Which one you, you pay attention to first, okay? So here, the numbers move. The numbers actually change where they were, right? What's the, the root word of commutativity? Right there. Commute. What does it mean to commute? Huh? Solve. Solve, what does it mean to solve? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be compute. What about commute? Yes? To move. To move, yeah, to move. Typically, you hear it in context of going to work. You commute to work. I come from five minutes down the road, and I commute to the school, and then I commute back to the house. Right? So you actually move. So the root word being commute, and commute meaning to move, that's when the numbers actually move. Okay? What are the numbers doing? They're moving. Okay? How about in associativity? What's the root word in associativity? Associate. What does it mean to associate, for two people to associate? Work together, right? So we have three people up here. I'll mention them by name. Alexis, Caleb, and Nicole, all up here. And uh, Alexis and Caleb could turn to each other. They don't have to go anywhere. They just look at each other. And we could call that associating, associating with each other. Okay? And then Nicole could come into that conversation. Or Nicole and Caleb could start a conversation, and uh, Alexis could come in uh, later. Yeah, Alexis could come in later, right? And and they have conversations. So there's no moving. Is what I'm saying. What happens is these two can associate first, and then the third, or these two can associate first, and and then bring in this first guy. It doesn't. They don't move around. They don't change their location. Okay. So these guys associate first, or these guys associate first, but they don't commute, they don't move anywhere, whereas in this one, they do move. All right. I think that horse is plenty dead. Let's um, move past these properties and go on to, well, let me have an assembly here in a few minutes. High school students, high school teachers, Please go down to the right Hold on just a second. Um, or if you're just going to check this on the website or wait for the text message to come, that's fine. Um, but I'm just going to give you a place to stop in 2.2. We've just gone through 2.1 and 2.2 up to. Let's just go up to 31. Okay. And like I said, that'll go out on the website and the text messages. So you can do it that way. You don't even have to write it down.